can get started early. Right, this is a research assignment. You can't do it in 24 hours. So yes, please do start early. Now, if you are having trouble finding sources for your paper, there are two things you can do, right? One, you can come talk to me and I will try to help you navigate the library systems as best we can. Um, an even better idea would be to try to make an appointment with our reference librarian. Right, we have a reference librarian on staff. His name is John Wilson. He's really good. You can reach him at john.wilson at gsw.edu. So if you do make an appointment with John, just make sure that you bring a copy of the assignment with you. You tell him sort of what generally it is you want to work on and he will help you navigate all of our library resources. Right? It's his job. It's what he is sort of specifically dedicated to doing. So, right. Um, also, um, there are a couple, I want to make sure everybody has made contact with their other group presentation members. So if there's anybody who has not yet made contact with their group, um, come talk to me at the end of class. I'll make sure you know who your fellow group members are um, and you can make that information exchange. Okay? Okay. Right. So, the piece of music that I was playing for you just now, um, some of you recognize parts of it, right? The Hall of the Mountain King is familiar. The little morning bit at the beginning is from the do 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 do. Anybody who's ever watched a commercial or Looney Tunes has probably heard um, some portion of this music. Does anybody know what Grieg wrote this piece for to accompany? Well. Not a ballet, but so we can make a good educated guess here probably, right? What? Yeah, a play, right? What did we read for today, right? We read a play. We read a play by Henry Gibson. So, yeah, Grieg wrote this music to accompany one of Ibsen's early plays. It's incidental music for a play called Per Gint. Now, today, we tend to think of the Scandinavian countries um, mostly in terms of their political, economic, and educational success, right? Somehow, these three small countries on the edge of, three or four small countries on the edge of Europe have managed to create um, wealthy, educated societies where resources are more or less evenly distributed and people seem to be really quite happy. So they get a lot of attention from political scientists, from educational theorists, from social scientists, trying to figure out, okay, why have these countries been so successful and how can this be replicated elsewhere? In the late 19th century, though, Scandinavia was backwater country. These countries were largely ignored. And Ibsen is part of a real kind of Scandinavian artistic flowering. Right, in music, you had Grieg and you know, the guy who wrote the Peregrine Suite here that we were listening to, and the Finnish composer, Jean, uh, Jean Sibelius. In visual arts, you had the paintings of Edvard Munch. How many of you have ever seen the, um, there's a famous painting called The Scream, you know this one? Yeah, that's Munch. And in drama, we had the Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen and the Swedish playwright August Strindberg. Strindberg is a really interesting character. Um, he wrote really, really brilliant plays, but he was a fierce misogynist um, and at one point believed that his wife was trying to kill him telepathically. Seriously ill individual, but wrote some really, really great plays. So, <clears throat> we're going to focus today primarily on these achievements in drama. 
And first, I want to gauge somewhere, sort of, how did this, how this play went for you, right? What did you think of this? You done married the wrong woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it that Tessman married the wrong woman, or that Hedda married the wrong man? If we, <laughs> if we think about what this guy is like, right? What do we know about this guy, George Tessman? What does the play tell us and show us about George Tessman and his habits and interests? What's that? <laughs> yeah, he is incredibly fucking boring, right? He is horribly dull. He is a highly specialized scholar, right? He's a historian. He studies the handicrafts of medieval Brabant. Right, so highly specialized bullshit right? <laughs> that few people actually care very much about. But he is passionately interested in this. Right, I think it's probably um, relevant that he's really interested in domestic handicrafts as his um, focus of scholarship. We'll just sort of put that over here for a moment. What else do we know about this guy? What, what else about this guy is really annoying? Mm, yeah. Does he have any other interesting or irritating verbal tics? What's the phrase that he keeps repeating over and over and over again, almost every, almost every time he speaks? No, no, the only thing that really annoyed me was that hmm thing. <laughs> okay, there's the hmm thing, yeah. He constantly goes, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's always asking me a question. He's always speaking a question. Okay, he spe frequently speaks in questions, yeah. And he often begins and ends his statements with, think of that, or just think, right? So he sounds like someone who is constantly surprised by mundane, everyday occurrences. Now, can we see ways in which somebody like Tessman would be really, really annoying to live with? Yeah, this guy would grate on just about anybody's nerves. What about the relationship with the aunts? Who seems to come first in his life? His wife or his elderly aunts? Yeah, aunts come first. What about his reaction to getting his old house slippers? Yeah, he's really excited about getting these house slippers. In fact, I've even made a note for myself here on the bottom of page 787 after he gets the slippers, right? He is the most boring man in the world. Right, if we look at so bottom of page 787, uh, can I get two volunteers? Or can I get a Hedda and a Tessman? All right, you be Hedda, Sydney, you be Tessman. So start with um, Tessman opening it. I'm Tessman. Or sure, go ahead. You be Tessman, and she can be Hedda. Okay, opening it. <coughs> oh my lord, you kept them from me, Aunt Julie. Hedda, isn't this touching? Hmm? Well, what is it? My old house slippers. My slippers. Oh, yes. I remember how often you talked about them in that <laughs> Yes, well, I really miss them. Now you can see them for yourself, Hedda. <laughs> oh, no, thanks. I don't really care for you. Just think, Aunt Rena, lying these embroidering, laying these embroidering for me, sick as she is. Oh, you couldn't possibly believe how many memories are tangled up in these slippers. <laughs> they've been on a, yeah, they, so they've been off on their honeymoon, and apparently on their honeymoon, he wouldn't shut up 
about his damn slippers. <laughs> That's when you know you're very well. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there, there is, you know, the, the play ends arguably tragically, but there is this real element of comedy in this as well. I mean, this guy is over the top ridiculous. Not only that, right, he's expecting a professorship, right? He's just finished his doctorate. He's expecting a professorship is going to come through for him any day now. But he is also, as a scholar, right, he is what we would call a mediocrity. His interests are very, very narrow, very, very focused, very, very mundane. And what he's really good at is organizing and cataloging notes. Right? Tessman's not an ideas guy. He's a diligent, plodding sort of scholar. Yeah, go ahead. So he got his doctorate, and all he does is just organize stuff, like these notes. Yeah, you'd be you'd be you'd be amazed what some people do to get doctorates. <laughs> um, I also I found it interesting. There's a footnote here. It says something about how um, you know professorships in Norway in the late 19th century were highly competitive and difficult to get, unlike today. <laughs> yeah, no, the the editors lived in a different world <laughs> when tenure track jobs were roamed freely across the across the land. You didn't have to move halfway across the country to get one. But I digress. Now, who could we most productively juxtapose Tessman against? What character would seem most like his direct opposite? The, the, um, the girl's husband. Or not husband, but the other guy's name. <laughs> okay, yeah, he and his wife do have deeply opposite interests, yeah. But there is this other character as well, right? Yeah. Eiler Loveberg, yeah. yeah. And how is Loveberg different from Tasman? For, go ahead. He's a famous alcoholic. Okay, on the one, yeah. He does not have Tasman's steady, respectable bourgeois habits, right? He is dissolute and decadent. He drinks and cavorts with prostitutes. But what else is Loveberg that Tessman isn't? He's interesting. Okay, he's interesting. In part because he's bad, right? But also, what has he got going for him that Tessman does? Why is Tessman so afraid? When he figured, when he finds out that Loveborg might compete with him for the professorship. Book. It's popular. He's getting famous. Yeah, Tessman's a mediocre scholar, but Loveborg is a genius. Right, Loveborg is actually brilliant. I mean, and when he's reading from his manuscript at Judge Brack's party, he's got the whole crowd spellbound and eating out of his hand. Right? This is a guy who has ideas, who is capable of original thought, and not of simply cataloging and describing objects from the past. So apart from simply being more interesting and probably more fun to be around, right? Loveborg is much smarter than Tessman. Now, what's Loveborg's relationship then with Hedda? They used to have relations. Actually, they didn't. If we look at um, when Loveborg comes to visit for the first time, and they're sitting talking alone. We look on page 812.
Actually, let's start, actually start on page 811 here. Right, the two of them are alone. Tessman and Judge Brack have gone off to go talk together. Can I get two volunteers? Can I get a Lovborg and a Hedda? All right, you be Lovborg, you be Hedda. Great. So start with um, just answer me one thing, James. Page eight eleven. Uh, Near the middle of the page. Just answer me one thing. Oh. Yes. <laughs> In our relationship, wasn't there any love there either? No trace, not a glimmer of love in any of it? I wonder if there really was. For me, it was like you were two good comrades, two really good faithful friends. I remember you were particularly frank and open. That's how you wanted it. When I look back on it, it was something really beautiful, something fascinating, something brave about this secret com comrade com comradeship. Comradeship, yep. This secret intimacy that no living soul has any idea about. Yes, Edda, that's true, isn't it? That was it. When I'd come to your father's in the afternoon, and the general would sit in the window reading his newspaper with that with his back tucked toward the room. And us on the corner sofa. Always with the same illustrated magazine in front of us. Instead of an album, yes. Yes, Edda. And when I made all those confessions to you, telling you things about myself that no one else knew in those days, sat there and told you how I lost whole days and nights in drunken frenzy, frenzy that would last for days on end. Ah, Hedda, what kind of power was in you that drew these confessions out of me? You think it was the power in me? Yes, I can't account for it in any other way. And you'd ask me all those ambiguous leading questions. Which you understood implicitly. How did you sit there and question me so fearlessly? Ambiguously? Yes, but fearlessly, all the same, questioning me about about things like that. And how did you answer them, Mr. Lovberg? Yes, yes. That's just what I don't understand anymore. But now tell me, Hedda, wasn't it love underneath it all? Wasn't that part of it? You wanted to purify me, to cleanse me, when I'd seek you, when I'd seek you out to make my confessions. Wasn't that it? No, no, not exactly. Then what drove you? Do you find it so hard to explain that a young girl, when it becomes possible, in secret? Yes. That she wants a glimpse of a world that? That? That is not permitted to her. So that what is? That too, that too, I almost believe it. Com <clears throat> Comrades in a quest for life, so why couldn't it go on? That was your own fault. You broke it off. Yes, when it looked like reality threatened to spoil the situation. Shame on you, Elliot Rothberg. How could you do violence to your comrade in arms? Well, why didn't you do it for real? Why didn't you shoot me dead right then and there like you threatened to? Oh, I'm much too afraid of scandal. Yes, Hedda, underneath it all, you were a coward. All right, thank you very much. You can stop there. Well done. <laughs> OK, so what we get here, what was it that ended their relationship? Yes, she threatened to shoot him. What? And why did she threaten to shoot him? She got scared. Yeah, what scared her? What did he do? Drunken frenzy. <laughs> <laughs> she, the drunken frenzy's all right, right? She likes hearing about the drunken frenzy. She likes hearing about his late night bacchanals and his, you know, romps through the gutter. What doesn't she want from him? that he wants from her. Love? Serious relationship, maybe? Yeah, she doesn't want love. She doesn't want sex. She denies both of these things, right? Why does she get so upset whenever Tessman starts talking about how she's filling out since their trip? What is he trying to suggest? That she's pregnant. Yeah, that she might be pregnant. Right? When Aunt Julie keeps talking about you, know, it's like, oh, you, do you have something you want to tell George? You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what she's hinting at, right? It's like, are you pregnant, dear? 
you know, oh, is there going to be another little bundle of joy in our house? And to Hedda, the very idea of this is disgusting. She completely denies these kinds of connections with other people. She wants to hear about all of Loveberg's midnight rambles, but she doesn't want to participate in them, and she doesn't want to participate in his life. So what does this tell us about her general approach to life? How does she live? She's an observer, not a participant. Yeah, she lives vicariously through others. She sits back and watches other people live and will sometimes manipulate other people in order to get them to do something interesting. Right, like when she's fighting with um, Thea and Loveberg about the manuscript, right? She knows she has the manuscript. She could just give it to Loveberg and everything would be great. All, all this would be resolved, right? Everything would be fixed. But she doesn't. She withholds it. Why does she withhold it? Yeah, she wants to watch him fight, right? <laughs> at first, right, she wants to watch him. You know, it's like, how many of you ever had, like, an ant farm when you were a kid? Anybody? Did you ever, like, you know, get bored watching them make their little tunnels and shake up the ant farm just to see what would happen? <laughs> That's kind of what she's doing, right? She's shaking the ants and watching all of their intricately constructed lives, all their intricately constructed tunnels, right? Thea, she thinks, has turned Loveborg into someone boring because she's got him off the sauce um, and she's got him, you know, by and large on the straight and narrow. Well, that has to be stopped. You don't want Loveborg ending up like Tessman, right? You don't want to take this brilliant, decadent, dissolute scholar and turn him into somebody boring. She's such a drama mom. Yeah, well, but she doesn't want to participate in the drama. She just wants to set it up and make it happen. She acts more like a director than like an actor or a character, right? And why does she burn the manuscript? That's what she tells George, right? Does she give a shit whether Tessman gets that professor job or not? No. Does she give a shit about anything Tessman does? No. Does Tessman really give a shit about anything she does? No, I mean, you know, we, we, we find that, you know, their, their honeymoon, right? He spent six months digging through libraries for information on the domestic handicrafts of medieval Brabant, right? Now, if I had spent my honeymoon buried in libraries, researching something really, really dull and boring and ignoring my wife, I would be divorced now. <laughs> so one thing this gets at though is like, why did Hedda marry Tessman in the first place? <laughs> it is a good question, right? Well, let's think first off about the time period, right? The play, this play is written in 1890. How old are we told Hedda is? She's 29. And she's a newlywed. First marriage. In boot, yeah, exactly. In bourgeois European society in the late 19th century, this would be extremely unusual. Right? It would not have been normal for like, you know, Tessman is a little bit older than her, he's 33. That would not have been unusual, right? For a man to complete his education and to try to build up some nest of financial security before he got married and started a family. But then he would typically marry a much younger woman, right? Someone who was closer to, say, 18, 19, 20. Yeah, Hedda at 29 um, is married very, very late for a woman in her era and of her social class. And has she married someone of her social class? Yeah, she's married down. Not just in terms of character and brilliance, but in terms of social class as well. Right, the Tessmans are lower middle class. 
right? She's always, this is one of the reasons she's always making fun of Aunt Julie's clothes and hat and things like that. Oh, oh, does that hat belong to the maid, right? She knows perfectly well it doesn't belong to the maid. She's just trying to needle these eternal aunts who are always hovering around, right? They're people who are, he, she regards as beneath her. So <clears throat> she marries Tessman in part because 29 would have been considered long in the tooth, right? So if he got married, it's the kind of get it out the way. Yeah, well, and when, when you think about it, like, I mean, Tessman marries at 33 because he's completing his education and getting his prospects together. What other prospects would Hedda have had? Why does she have to live vicariously through Loveberg? Women didn't have a lot of opportunities back then. Yeah, she said, you know, she wants a glimpse of a world that's not permitted to her, right? She's not permitted to go out and live her own life. She's the general's daughter, so she has to maintain some sort of class facade there. And because she's a woman, and not a working class woman, right? If you're working class, everybody works, men or women. That's just the way it's always been. Um, because she's yeah, an upper middle class woman, or she's an aristocratic woman, really, um, she doesn't have that option without losing a lot of face. Basically, her only open path, is, well, her only two open paths are marriage or spinsterhood. And at least in a marriage, she can manipulate other people into doing things that are interesting. Now, it might help if we think a little bit about uh, historical context here as well. Ibsen is probably the great European dramatist of the late 19th century. And in part, this is because he doesn't really have a lot of competition. This is not to say that his plays aren't good, right? They are. But 19th century drama was a real kind of doldrums. Um, have any of you ever heard the term melodrama? Yes. You know what a melodrama is? Okay, what's a melodrama? Uh, a melodrama is like a really, really, I, I don't know how else to describe it, but a drama that's essentially just really drawn out and extra. Like, it's just incredibly just over the top. Okay, yeah, we tend to regard melodramatic, we tend to call over the top behavior melodramatic, right? It's like, oh, you're, you're just being melodramatic, right? But in theatrical parlance, this actually does refer to a particular type of play, right? It's not a comedy, it's not a tragedy. They're usually these sort of domestic dramas that focus on middle-class characters, and they all follow more or less the same pattern, right? You have a young heroine who is in some sort of trouble, probably financial, right? Oh, I can't pay the rents. And this dastardly villain with twirling mustaches sweeps in with his black hat and cape but you must pay the rent. But I haven't the money to pay the rent. Then you must sacrifice your virtue to me. <laughs> and then the hero steps in with the money from the other side of the stage. I'll pay the rent. Saved. Curses spoiled again. Right? That's melodrama. That's what these plays are like. They're terrible. <laughs> They're predictable. They all follow the same basic stupid pattern. But they were hugely popular in the 19th century, probably because one, they were really cheap to produce, really easy to come up with a script, you write it a formula, and by and large, audiences like things that are predictable, right? I mean, why do, you know, all of the, you know, like top 10 songs on the charts usually sound the same? 
We like the expected, right? We don't necessarily want to be challenged by the unfamiliar. So we flock to things that we recognize. Now Ibsen experimented with this particular formula quite a lot, largely in order to um, fix it or alter it, right? To criticize it from within. A sort of revision of this formula in order to show where it was weak. Now what Ibsen really wanted to do was kind of like, he wanted to uh, take away, he called it taking away the fourth wall, right? He wanted to write plays that were actually kind of looking into the parlors of these bourgeois individuals of his own time, basically members of his own social class, right? And find out what's really going on behind those doors. Normal people responding to extreme situations. It's like, um, you can think of this in terms of contemporary reality television, right? Why do people watch shows like uh, Keeping Up with the Kardashians or Duck Dynasty or 19 Kids and Counting, right? Are you watching these shows because you want to see normal people living normal lives? No. Oh, yeah. You watch these shows because these people are freaking weird, right? You watch these shows because these people aren't normal. It is not normal to have 19 children, right? It is not normal to be a sort of bearded wild man billionaire living in the bush blowing on duck calls, right? It is not normal to be whatever a Kardashian is. <laughs> people don't live that way. So realist plays like Ibsen's often end up being very constructed, very artificial, whether they intend to or not. And this is something Ibsen himself realizes. And so Hedda Gobbler represents a kind of new phase in Ibsen's career. She's a different kind of character than what he had typically written. Um, it's a different kind of plot structure. Now, there are a couple of things in the play that might hint to us at what he's going for. What sort of shape is often referred to in the play in terms of relationships between characters? I'm just talking a literal geometric shape. Triangle. Yeah, it talks a lot about triangles, right? Judge Brack, in particular, is always mentioning triangles. He wants to be the apex of this triangle between Hedda, Tessman, and himself, right? It's like, well, Tessman is such a dud, and he won't really notice if I'm coming up the, bar the garden path now and again for a cozy little visit with his wife, right? Judge Brack's goal is essentially to cuckold Tessman, right? When, um, Hedda refers to him as wanting to be the only cock of the walk. That's not, yeah, yeah, the sexual metaphor is intended, right? He wants to sleep with Hedda and figures Tessman will never notice. And from what we see of Tessman, Brack is probably right, right? His wife doesn't actually rank very high on Tessman's list of interests. If only she were a medieval handicraft. But <clears throat> this triangular shape, right? We, all, we also tend to see three characters on stage at the same time, right? Most of the most intense, most dramatic scenes involve these groups of three characters. This is actually drawn directly from Greek tragedy. This was the way Greek tragedy worked, right? There were three actors in a Greek play. Only three actors in any given Greek play, plus a chorus. There were often more than three characters in a Greek play, but you would switch roles by, putting, by changing your mask, right? You go backstage, you put on your mask, you come back as someone else. So 
<clears throat> All scenes in Greek plays are usually triangular. Now, is there anything else <clears throat> in the play that suggests Greek culture or Greek drama? Yeah, she wants to imagine him with vine leaves in his hair, right? Why does she want to imagine him with vine leaves in his hair? On the one hand, this is a reference to Loveborg's alcoholism, right? One of the things that made him interesting to her in the first place. What else is this referring to? They were thinking in a specifically Greek context. Why would the vine leaves matter? Is she like associating him with, and I forget his name, I'm real tired, but mm -hmm. the um, Greek god of like partying and alcoholism? Yeah, does anybody know the name of that god? Um, I know it, but I can't take it off the tip of my tongue. Dionysus. Dionysus, yes. Yeah. She is associating him with the Greek god Dionysus. And Dionysus is, as you said, he's the god of wine, the god of partying, and the god of what other things? Partying and wine at the same time? <laughs> yeah, okay. And what, what does wine lead to when Harvest. you are... Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Harvest. I was yeah, he is also a fertility god, yeah. But if you have too much wine and you party too hard, what does this lead to? What sort of emotional state? Um, drunken jubilance. Drunken jubilance, or a kind of frenzy, right? Dionysus is also a god of frenzy and madness. Now, why is he important in a dramatic context? Those of you who are taking World Lit 1 with me should know this. Because they're getting everything out, I guess. Like, uh -huh. you know, they're getting the frenzy and the madness out, you know. I don't know. I remember you talking about that right. story that he was, what he was is, there one time sure. they get to do that. Well, yeah, and, and um, what's, what's their one time they get to do that? Okay, Dionysus, for the Greeks, was a kind of uncomfortable god. Is it like right? a festival or something? Yeah. They put on these plays, they put on these tragedies at Dionysus' festival, right? They keep the god outside the city during the year because he's a god of things that the Greeks are not comfortable with, right? They like order, they like moderation, uh, they like logic and reason, and Dionysus is the opposite of all of those things. So the god's image is kept in a shrine outside the city for most of the year. But for these few days, when it's the god's festival, they bring him into the city, they put on these plays, and the purpose of a Greek tragedy, according to Aristotle, is ultimately catharsis, or purging. So it's... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, yeah, it's fine. So it's like Mardi Gras before Lent. Everybody's getting their like grossness out. Yeah, in a way, it's 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 actually probably very similar to Mardi Gras or Carnival, right? Where you um, you know you get all of your all of your you know carnal emotions out over a period of a couple of days, and then you can go back to being sober and severe and logical for the rest of the year, right? You let out everything you've been keeping bottled up for a few days and then just go back to normal life when the festival's over. So catharsis, according to Aristotle, is this kind of purging of emotion. Right? And this is what a, a tragedy, what a Greek play is, a, a Greek tragedy is supposed to do. It's supposed to be a communal purging of powerful emotions. So you can just go back to being your normal Greek logical self.
for the rest of the year. It's also often, dramatically speaking, a purging of difficult people. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, Oedipus the King or with Medea, with those plays? Okay, right. And what happens with the difficult or troublesome person at the end of those plays? They're always like... They're oh. always... <laughs> yeah. They die or they're exiled. Right? However else the play ends, the difficult person, the person who's causing trouble, the person who's disrupting order in society, ends up getting pushed out. Do we see something similar happening in this play? Is it kind of? What do you mean kind of? I kind of, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, if we want to talk about difficult people in this particular play, who is the person who just simply doesn't fit into this particular society? Hedda. Hedda is the obvious choice, right? No one else is quite on her social level. She doesn't participate in community life or relationships of any meaningful kind. Right? Loveborg offers to love her, but she refuses that gesture because of what would come with it. Tessman thinks he loves her, but really only loves weird little objects and his fucking slippers. <laughs> And even, you know, the judge simply wants to use her. Her old schoolmate, Thea Elvsted, is terrified of her because she used to threaten to burn her hair off. So, yeah, the difficult person, the person who doesn't fit into society, at the end of this kills herself, right? Now, why do you think Hedda commits suicide? In part, it satisfies the dramatic requirements of Greek tragedy. Difficult person off the stage. What do you think drives her to kill herself? I think she just wanted to be free from what she was stuck in. The way to get out of the lower class. Yeah. Okay. She's stuck in a cross-class marriage that does not make her happy. Um, What's her relationship with the, to the judge at this point? It might help if we actually uh, watch this final scene of the play. Um, so I want you to pay close attention to how Hedda reacts to the things the judge says. What thi what, which of his words, which of his lines really draw a strong reaction from her? And this will give us a stronger sense, I think, of what's going on here. And of course, our over-aggressive screensaver has locked everything up. You may recognize in this scene, or you may not recognize, a very young uh, pre-Gandalf Ian McKellen as, uh, as Tessman. Um, could somebody actually um, get those blinds back there just so we don't have the light shining in? Thank you. Awesome. Release Mrs. Hedda. Well, it's a release for him, of course. I don't mean for him. I mean for me. The release of knowing that someone can do something really brave, something beautiful. My uh, dear Mrs. Hedda. Ah, I know what you're going to say. You're a bourgeois at heart, too, just like. <laughs> oh, well. I don't know if meant more to you than you're willing to admit even to yourself, or am I wrong? I'm not answering questions like that for you. I only know that I love Bullock. 
has had the courage to live according to his own principles. And now, at last, he's done something really big, really beautiful. To yes. have the courage and the will to rise from the feast of life so early. It distresses me deeply, Mrs. Heather, but I'm afraid I must rob you of that charming illusion. Illusion? You wouldn't be allowed to keep it for long, anyway. What do you mean? He didn't shoot himself on purpose. Not on purpose? No. It didn't happen quite the way I told you. You've been hiding something. What is it? To spare poor Mrs. Elstead's feelings, I allowed myself one or two small equivocations. What? To begin with, he's already dead. He died at the hospital? Yes, without regaining consciousness. What else haven't you told us? The incident did take place at his lodging. <laughs> well, that's utterly unimportant. Not utterly. The fact is, you see, Ilot Lohberg was found shot in Mademoiselle Danielle's boudoir. That's impossible. He can't have been there today. He was there this afternoon. He went to ask for something he said they'd stolen from him. Talk some crazy nonsense about a child who just got lost. Oh, so that was the reason. I thought at first he might be referring to his manuscript. But I understand he destroyed that himself, so he must have meant his wallet, I suppose. Yes, I suppose so. So they found him there? Yes, there, with a discharged pistol in his pocket. The shot had wounded him mortally. Yes, in the breast. No, the stomach. The lower part. And that too. <laughs> oh. Why does everything I touch become mean and <laughs> ludicrous? It's like a curse. Something else, Mrs. Hedder. It's rather disagreeable to him. What? The pistol he had on him. Yes, what of it? He must have stolen it. Stolen it? That isn't true. He didn't. It's the only explanation. He must have stolen it. Well, uh, shh. We can't see you've got there uh, under the lamp. It would be possible for us to come and look at it. Yes, of course. Well, my pretty dear, and how is work progressing on our little Hogs Memorial? Oh, it's going to be terribly difficult to get these into any order. We've got to do it, we must. After all, putting other people's papers into order is rather my speciality, what? <laughs> what was that about the pistol? I said he must have stolen it. Why do you think that? Because any other explanation is unthinkable, Mrs. Hedda, or to be. I see. I had love with us here this morning, wasn't he? Yes. Were you alone with him? For a few moments. Did you go out of the room while he was here? No. Think again. Are you quite sure you didn't go out of the room if only for a moment? Yes, I might have gone into the hall for a few seconds. Where was your pistol case during this time? I knocked it in Mrs. That... Hedder. It was lying over there on my writing table. Have you looked to see if both pistols are still there? No. You needn't bother. I saw the pistol Lohberg had on him when they found him. I recognized it at once from yesterday and other occasions. Do you have it? No, the police have it. And what will the police do with this pistol? Try to trace the owner. Do you think they'll succeed? No. Head of Gardler. Not as long as I hold my tongue. And if you don't? You could always say it's stolen. I'd rather die. People say that they never do it. wasn't stolen and they traced the owner. What then? There'll be a scandal, Hedda. A scandal? Yes, a scandal, a thing you're so frightened of. You'll have to appear in court together with Mademoiselle Danielle. She'll have to explain how it all happened. Was it an accident or was it homicide? Did he, was he about to take the pistol from his pocket and shoot her with it? Or did, did it go off? Or did she snatch it from his hand? 
shoot him in and then put it back in his pocket. She might quite easily have done it. She's a very resourceful lady, is Mademoiselle Danielle. Yes. But I have nothing to do with this repulsive business. No. But you'll have to answer one question. <laughs> Why did you hear I let her burn that pistol? And what conclusion will people draw when it is proved that you did give it to him? I see. I hadn't thought of that. Well, luckily there's no danger. Not as long as I hold my tongue. In other words, I'm in your power. From now on, you've got your hold over me. Heather, my dearest, believe me, I will not abuse my position. Nevertheless, I'm in your power, dependent on your will and your demands. Not free, still not free. No, I couldn't bear that. No. Most people resign themselves to the inevitable sooner or later. Yes. I suppose they do. Well, George, think you'll be able to manage what? Hmm? Heaven knows, dear, this is going to take months and months, by Joe. Well, imagine hmm. that, by Joe. Hmm. Isn't it strange, Tara? Yeah, you are working away with Tesman just the way you used to work with Ivor at Lovebrook. Oh, if only I can inspire your husband, too. Mm. Oh, it'll calm you tight. Yes, do you know, Heather, I really feel like beginning to feel a little well at work. Yes, but uh, you go back and talk to Judge Clark. Well, can't I be of any use to you, Phil, No, no, uh, not at all. Uh, you'll have to keep Heather company from now on to see if she doesn't get bored, Judge, uh, if you don't mind. It'll be a pleasure. Thank you. Mm. Well, yes. But I'm tired. Not to have any. Not to have any. Mm. Edith, dear. Please. Pick a line, that's it. And pull on to read her. And that's you two. And all the rest of them. From now on, I'll be quiet. The distress is her to watch us doing this. I, I have an idea, Mrs. Austin. Why don't you move me with Auntie Juju? Hmm? I could run down for each evening and uh, we could sit and work there, what? Yes, that might be the best plan. Hmm. I can hear what you're saying, Tesman. But how shall I spend the evenings out here? I'm, I'm sure Judge Brock will be kind enough to come over and keep you company. You won't mind my not being here, Judge. I shall be delighted, Mrs. Tesman. I'll be here every evening. We'll have great fun, you and I. Now he's playing with his pistol. Pistol, pistol! Pistol, 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 Good God. People don't do such things. Okay, so first question here. How is Hedda behaving with the judge at the beginning of this scene? She's kind of um, cocky and sort of proud of what Lois Brick did. Yeah, what was he supposed to do when she gave him that pistol? What was he supposed to do with it, apart from the obvious? Let me put it here. How was he supposed to do the obvious? Use the powers of death in this time, you know, get the evidence gone. Not so. We're, we're talking like when, when she gives Loveborg the pistol, right? What she, what's Loveborg supposed to do? Oh. He's supposed to shoot himself, right? Of course. And how is he supposed to do it? Straight through the heart. Through the head, through the heart, whatever, right? Doesn't really matter where, so long as he does it beautifully, 
right? She wants from Loveborg this beautiful aesthetic death. Now, there, she's told that he shot himself at home initially, right? But what information has the judge brought to her? Has he shot himself on purpose? No. No, he's not shot himself on purpose. They found a discharged pistol in his pocket. Did he shoot himself at home? No. No, he shot himself in a brothel. And where did he shoot himself? Basically, he accidentally shot his dick off, right? That's what's, ha that's what's happened, right? To put it in the most concrete possible terms. So like the grossest possible death? Yes, the ugliest, most sordid possible death. So once she receives this information, is she still exulting in Loveborg's death? She doesn't care whether Loveborg lives or dies, right? What's Loveborg to her? What she cares about is that he dared to live and die beautifully. And because he didn't, right? One, he couldn't let go of that manuscript. He went back to the brothel to demand its return. Two, he shot himself accidentally in the most horrible possible way. Right, this shows her that her power to direct the scenes of people's lives um, is in fact limited, right? If she has any at all. And what sorts of things that go on in this scene demonstrate to us that her power over others um, is limited or ineffectual? Mm -hmm. She's trying to get away from people. Yeah, she, she starts acting twitchy, yeah. How does she behave towards Tessman and Thea when they're sitting there working on Loveborg's papers? Overly affectionate and cloyingly sweet. Yeah, which she's never, which she, she has never been sincerely anyway, right? When she behaves like that, she's always being insincere. And what does Tessman tell her when she asks if there's anything at all that she can be a part of or that she can do? No, nothing, no, we don't need you, no, you know, we're good here, think of that, right? All's well. Who's the only person who still needs or wants anything to do with her? The judge. And what's her relationship to the judge now? Yeah, he basically owns her, or certainly thinks he does. What does he think she'll do, and why does he think she'll do it? He thinks she'll submit because, mm -hmm. you know, people, in his words, people simply just don't, you know, kill themselves. They always follow his seeming mental status quo. Sure. He assumes that people really fear scandal more than they fear unpleasantness. Right? We see here, do we see echoes of another hypocrite character? from earlier in the course here. Whose, um, whose ideas, whose language, is, if, uh, whose language is he borrowing from? Who preached a similar gospel? Think back to French plays about religious imposters. Tartuffe. Yeah, exactly. Tartuffe says almost exactly the same thing, right? It's scandal that gives offense, right? It is no sin to sin in confidence, right? As long as nobody knows about it, you'll make accommodation with this. People usually do. Right? People become comfortable with the inevitable. So he assumes that she shares his view of human nature, right? that people will ultimately do whatever is easiest for them. But is she already showing signs in their conversation that she is not simply going to accommodate herself to him? Yes. What does she refuse to lie about the whole time they're talking? The 
Yeah. She refuses to say the gun was stolen. Because if she says the gun was stolen, that Loveborg took it himself and she didn't know about it, that robs her, as her of her role as director of the scene, right? The scene's already gone wrong. Loveborg did not do what he was supposed to. The death he died was ugly and sordid. And certainly, you know, you know, a terrible end for a brilliant and promising scholar. But she refuses to admit to the judge or to anyone. Or she refuses to lie about it, right? She refuses to lie to the judge or to anyone else and say that she had nothing to do with it. That he got the pistol somehow without her knowledge. So the judge is already making faulty assumptions about Hedda's character, right? Based on how he believes a normal person would behave. The average person in Hedda's circumstances, he assumes, would simply acquiesce, right? The melodrama heroine with no hero on the horizon to come rescue her, rescue her would simply fall into the arms of the mustache twirling villain because she has no choice. There's no other option. And this is the this is sort of defined Hedda's horizons throughout her life, right? She has no option other than marriage. Her social class limits her horizons, limits her options. Right? She's not gonna get an education. She didn't educate women. And now she is in the power of the judge. Does she have anybody she can turn to for help? No. No. Tessman has already completely forgotten she exists, by and large, right? He's so engrossed in Loveborg's papers, he, doesn't, he barely notices. I mean, when he opens the door and finds her dead, does there seem to be any fundamental change in his character? <laughs> Imagine that, right? <laughs> Just think. He's as surprised by this as he is by anything else, right? But we've already seen that this is a guy who is surprised by absolutely everything. Right? He maintains a remarkable innocence throughout. The judge is surprised as well because this is not the way people behave. People just don't do this sort of thing. So why is this for Hedda? The only possible option. She can't successfully choreograph someone else's suicide, right? We've seen that. Loveborgs went all wrong. What can she successfully choreograph? Wow. Yeah. She can successfully choreograph her own suicide. So because he screwed up, she's going to self-fulfill her own like little like image of having suicide? That's one possible interpretation of this, right? One possible explanation that, well, okay, Loveborg couldn't do it beautifully. I can't make someone else do this beautifully, so I can do it beautifully. But does she manage? a beautiful suicide. No, she did it after she had some sort of psychological, like, spiraling. Uh-huh. Not only that, but if we look at the way the other characters in the room are reacting to her behavior and to her suicide, right? This is not some great aesthetic purging of emotion that happens. Nobody here has vine leaves in their hair. There's no invocation of Dionysus. Right? There's just you know, a vaguely surprised idiot standing in the doorway looking at a corpse and probably thinking about his slippers <laughs> and a stunned judge 
who expected um, at least a couple of years of sexual fulfillment out of this um, and now isn't going to get that. So even her own suicide is, if not ugly and sordid, it's ridiculous. Right? There's something absurd about it. Now, there are, we're, we don't have too much time, so I'm not going to belabor this point, but this is something that will be useful to think about in the next couple of class sessions as well. Um, there's a philosophical school that arises in Scandinavia in the mid-19th century uh, called existentialism. The first exponent of this uh, philosophy is uh, a Danish thinker writing in the 1840s uh, named Soren Kierkegaard. Anybody ever heard of existentialism before? Anybody familiar at all with the term? Yeah. Passing? Okay. What do you What do you know about it, Valerie? Well, I know like they say you have an existential crisis. Like yeah. You can't. Why? Yeah. Yeah. What? Why am I here? What am I doing? Um, What's the point of all of this? And yeah, that does actually relate directly back to existentialist philosophy, the basis of which is that all action is inherently meaningless. Right? There is nothing in the world that has any given, intrinsic, inherent meaning, according to an existentialist. The only meanings that anything in the world has are meanings that we assign to them. Right, so meaning is a function of human consciousness, not of anything that actually exists in the environment. Now, there are two ways that people deal with this particular realization, according to an existentialist. The first and more common reaction is to attempt to cling to artificial systems of meaning, order, duty, right? My place in society, my place in the church, whatever, right? I will cling to that and I will obey that particular position because I can't deal with the idea that nothing I do actually means anything. The second way one deals with this particular realization, right, the existential crisis that you mentioned, is to simply accept it. All right. Nothing I do has any meaning apart from the meaning that I give that I give to it. Okay, I'm all right with this. I can live with this. Um, it's similar to um, a thought experiment concocted by uh, Friedrich Nietzsche called uh, the eternal uh, eternal recurrence. Anybody ever heard of this before? Okay, the way eternal recurrence works, right? Nietzsche asks you to imagine that you are endlessly falling down a chasm. You are never at any point in the future going to not be falling down this chasm. This is all that's going to happen to you for the rest of your life. You're not going to die. You're never going to hit bottom. It's never going to end. On top of that, there's a little demon sitting on your shoulder and it keeps whispering in your ear, it never gets better. It never gets better. Gets better. Always going to be the same. That sounds like a really accurate description of depression. Yeah. Well, and again, like, well, this this is um, for Nietzsche. This experiment is how you tell the superior sort of person from the inferior sort of person, right? The inferior sort of person for Nietzsche gives in to what he calls angst, right? Fear, terror, and just starts panicking, right? Oh my God, things are never going to get better. The superior sort of person, according to Nietzsche, the sort of, you know, what he would imagine as the, you know, the ubermensch or superman, accepts this 
puts up with it, and endures it stoically. So I introduce this in part because I think it is relevant to the play. Right? Hedda can't accept that her actions have no inherent meaning. None of the characters can accept that their actions have no inherent meaning. So they cling to these particular social roles and can thus muddle through in their daily lives. Hedda has no particular social role to cling to. As we see in that final scene, she has no place in it. She has no real place in this world. And so, chooses to take herself out of it. This is going to be really, really important stuff when we get to talking about modernism. So, I'm going to um, post a couple of reading questions for next time because I have not accidentally shut the computer off this time. We're going to be looking at a couple of manifestos uh, written by uh, modernist art movements. We're going to be looking at one by the Futurist Movement in Italy, the Dada Movement that uh, came together in Switzerland, and the uh, Surrealist Movement, which was a sort of specifically French uh, form of modernist thoughts.